Greetings again from Asian Institute of Technology and welcome to Keynote Session 3. Uh, I will be your MC and uh, without further ado, I will be introducing the session chair. I'm sure all of you know already who Dr. Injurit Paul is. Uh, he is uh, the chair for DRSD 2021 Disaster Preparedness Mitigation and Management Program in AIT. Uh, we don't have to repeat everything. <laughs> so uh, let it, I will be turn turning over the mic to Dr. Paul. Welcome, Dr. Paul. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'll be the moderator. So we have uh, chair of the session, uh, Dr. Sanjay Sivasta from UNSCAP. So this session is actually, I was discussing last week uh, with Gretchen and also we could not get time and thanks to both of you, Gretchen and Leonard, taking out your extremely busy schedule. I know, I know how busy you are in this time and really thankful and it's really odd time in for Leonard. I mean, it's very early morning, right? Thank you so much. First. First of all, and also to Dr. Sanjay. Uh, so I'll not take much time. I'll introduce Dr. Sanjay and I'll hand over to Dr. Sanjay for the session. Uh, before handing over to Dr. Sanjay, I'd like to briefly introduce Dr. Sanjay to all of you. Dr. Sanjay Sivastav is working with uh, UNSCAP Bangkok for quite a lot of years. And he had, uh, we also having MOU signed with UNSCAP, like AIT and uh, UNSCAP. Uh, working uh, closely with the disaster management uh, domain uh, for the Asia Pacific. Dr. Sanjay is uh, also, uh, he was also head in SARC Disaster Management Center, New Delhi from 2007 and 8. Also deputy project director of the disaster management support program in uh, one of the renowned and prestigious organization in India, Indian Space Research Organization. He's scientist, senior scientist at ISRO headquarters, Bangalore. Uh, in 1991. So I'd like to hand over Dr. Sanjay for his uh, presentation. So he'll uh, brief you about the context and then I think he'll uh, request our key note speakers uh, to deliver their lectures, sessions. Thank you. Over to Sanjay. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Paul uh, and my fellow colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure and privilege to be with you uh, on this occasion. Share some thoughts and then I will come back to our uh, the keynote speakers. So uh, uh, thanks again to Professor Paul that uh, uh, some scene setting presentation he requested me to make. Uh, so I thought uh, this is a AIT conference and that audience is all technology audience, mostly technical scientists, engineers in, in, among the key audiences. So I thought, let me customize this presentation to set the scene. So what I'm going to do is to, uh, to share with you uh, some of the emerging technologies, particularly the frontier technology and what it means to disaster resilience in coming days. Uh, so my first slide is uh, uh, before uh, before I start this presentation, what I would like to share with you in last one and a half years, uh, how the region, the whole world has seen disasters. It has not seen disaster alone. It has seen disaster with uh, the global pandemic. Uh, this diagram captures uh, particularly Asia Pacific regions, you see the, the dark red uh, is the region where there are COVID cases more than 10 million and then the uh, red colors and different colors. So with the backdrop of widespread COVID, which all of you are aware of, there are a number of disasters uh, happening. Now how the country respond uh, to such kind of a cascade or um, uh, are, are converging disaster risk and both are of two different origin. Uh, hydrometeorological disaster has a different origin. Pandemic has a different origin. They have a very different SOPs, very different protocols. Then how countries manage this? Uh, if I come to my next slides, it shows a collision of two hazards on the ground. 
You see, one year back, Cyclone Nisarga, my left hand side, slide. Cyclone Nisarga hit COVID 18th June 2020. You see, that time uh, it was a storm and then COVID moderately spreading on the ground. So, you know, it was a 10,000 to 100,000 on the ground. In midst of this, you see the tropical cyclone Nisarga hit. One year later, the situation was much worse. The situation on the ground was there were 10 million cases on the ground to the cyclone tracks. And then at the same time, cyclone hit. So you have two storms together, a storm of COVID on the ground and the storm that is the tropical cyclone, uh, K, uh, which hit the western coast of India. Now two disasters together of different origins but the vulnerability of the people is the same the common how to manage and these are the real challenges unprecedented it has never happened before uh, in our recent memory uh, how will you manage pandemic and disasters together and this is where the role of technology the innovations makes so much difference so my next slide is to to tell you that in asia pacific regions how country manage this pandemic and disasters together uh, you can very well imagine this pandemic had no vaccination of course speaking it's speaking up now but since last one and a half years there was no vaccination few pharmaceutical measures of uh, containing and preventing so most of the containment measures were the technology intensive measures the country who had edge in technologies they could able to manage this pandemic and disaster together better those who had a big data robotics artificial intelligence iot all together uh, the story is very clear from the reasons many who were uh, the, who succeeded containing COVID. They succeeded because of the effective use of the technology and that to the frontier technology. But then uh, what are the trends and what? how could we visualize the future for a resilient future? So here I would like to share with you a, our UN report, uh, which has taken the technology the way it is uh, driving the whole world, the, 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 the technological progress. In 2018, uh, the frontier technology had 350 billion mark, which comprised artificial intelligence, AI, big data, all what you see, including the gene editing, nanotechnology, solar voltage. So all fourth generation technology, 350 billion in 2018-19. Today, when we look at just few years extrapolation by 2025, just four years from now, this market is going to be 3.2 trillion dollars, nine to ten times increase. That shows the rapid pace of the technology uh, in the coming world. But what does it mean to disaster resilient common? For, for disaster uh, risk reduction community. Uh, I could able to tell you uh, what does it mean to DRR community. Uh, as I mentioned to you, 3 billion today, uh, last year is going to be 3.2 trillion by 2025. And the biggest jump is IoT, Internet of Things. And that means that whole world is going to be digital. And COVID has accelerated this process like never before. So when in a digitalized world, you have all technology with you, how disaster management uh, community is going to benefit and whether can we benefit, can we enhance our capacity? So what I would, I, we just mapped out, what does it mean to disaster management? It means that we are going to expand our, our outreach. We are going to expand our capability, whether it's a drone, robotics, IoT. We are going to connect people, thanks to IoT, people, things, and information. It's all cloud company. We are going to improve the quality of the data analysis and presentation of the information, right information to right people at right time. And then what is most important part of all this is human is going to be as a resource. So it will not be a unidirectional, it's a bi-directional 
people on the ground will interact. So it's a citizen science which is going to make a lot of difference. So if you look at some of the recent examples, just a snapshot, uh, uh, the, see for example, this is the artificial intelligence based uh, second generation flood forecasting in Ganga, Brahmaputra, Meghna Basin of India and Bangladesh. This is by the Google uh, AI engine. You see they have used all digital topographic and hydrologic map with the historic data from the Airbus and the host of the uh, Earth observation commercial including defense satellite and hydrologic modeling together and as a reach as a result of which they improve the quality of the forecast its precision the lead time and this is a tremendous uh, improvement in our traditional capacity for flood forecasting and early one uh, my next game changer application is the coastal uh, what we call a storm surges and the sea level rise. Uh, most of the assessment of the coastal, uh, particularly the risk in the coastal ecosystem was made with topographic data, mostly derived from SRT, and this is the subtle radar imaging topographic mission of NASA, which 90 meter uh, resolution contour. Many countries, they did it with uh, ALTM, air bore terrain later mappers, which was very costly. Uh, unaffordable in many cases, but there is a recent development of using uh, machine learning uh, to improve the quality of coastal geomorphology, particularly the topographic mapping. And as a result, you see a very substantial improvement in the quality of to coastal topographic mapping and looking at sea level rise, a storm surges is much more precise than ever before. So if we have to build a resilient coastal city, these are the key and game changer applications in days to come. Uh, my next slide shows, if you have to take climate models and then you have to see topographic uh, models together uh, in a scenario like this of New York City, I took this slide from my colleagues, uh, and then you could able to visualize your future 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20, uh, 30 years from now. So if you have to be a forward looking in a climate change scenario, you must visualize your future sitting uh, using all technological tools before planning your development of your cities. Uh, my in the third part, which is a very important part and particularly I would like to insist is most important part is the local innovations. The technology innovation is like a water set development. You have a upper reaches, but a downstream at local level, people must be made capable to use technology, to domesticate technology. I would like to particularly highlight, this is a case study of Bharavi in Mumbai. This is the Asia's biggest slum. It has an area of 2.5 kilo, uh, square kilometer, but the population density is 1 million, world's most densely populated slum. So this is a place where when uh, COVID hit, it was like a super spreader. Everybody imagined this will be an epicenter of COVID in Mumbai. But it happened in the beginning. But later, you use technology to empower people. The local innovations use risk zoning, training and a skill development of the epidemiologists, the local build awareness. You communicate the risk so effectively you change their behavioral pattern, use testing, tracking, testing, and finally invest in trust building with the government, with the people all together. So even the most vulnerable community of the world to the COVID were protected. They are better protected than the elites of Mumbai uh, many times here. So that's what shows the local innovations. And my final slide is you must have top-down approach as well. A government must visualize the future and plan its, uh, its, 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 its development, uh, leapfrog the development. The Korea is one example. They call what is called Korea New Deal. You see, they have $240 billion, what they call as a COVID a stimulus package, out of which 24% was allocated for data network, artificial intelligence and then digitalization 
many things. So you need to have a balance between the technology, your green infrastructure, including the social net. So this is what is requires a vision for a country to capitalize on the future technology. This is what I would like to end my presentation. My fellow colleagues are brilliant people. I'm sure they are going to take many of the new ideas forward. But my last point is we are going to have a Asia Pacific Disaster Committee is the Intergovernmental Committee of UNSCAP from 25th to 27th August. And there will be a launch of Asia Pacific Disaster Report. Many of the examples that I highlighted is uh, upcoming in this report. You will see a very well illustrated reports and then resilience week. So I will request my colleagues, uh, those my students, my AIT uh, students to attend this meeting. These are all online. It will be very helpful for you in uh, building our partnership. So thank you very much. So this is where I'd like to end and request my fellow colleagues for for their uh, keynote presentation. So uh, so over to you, Dr. Paul, and thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. It is excellent, like a good start and it's a, uh, making our base also very strong with the two strong presenter, keynotes present, presenter uh, first. Uh, we are proje projecting, so maybe I'd like to request you to introduce Dr. Reinhard. Dr. Reinhard having uh, 20 years of experience in analyzing and addressing the socioeconomic aspects. Uh, we are really fortunate. Uh, uh, we are also closely working with Reinhard's group uh, with uh, IASA in Austria on, on the modeling component, especially the CAT SIM model. They are, they are used to uh, work for, for quite long years. His interest is to provide the technical solution, evidence-based uh, advice to wide range of uh, public and private sectors, decision makers to improve the decision and build resilience against the salient risk. So, so this is one of the key area also AIT is focusing in uh, integrating the social and uh, technological part. So uh, thank you so much Reinhardt taking out your busy schedule uh, for, for uh, giving us insight about your recent study. So what to you? Thank you, Idrajit. Um, yeah, warm welcome from Vienna. Yeah, it's not so early here, but I'm happy to join your meeting um, at this exciting conference. No, excited to be in that uh, conference. I would have liked to be there, but that's the world that we live in. So that session is about technological and social innovation pathways to take us forward into that safe and inclusive space. We had an excellent um, presentation by Dr. Silvastava on the technology. I'm sure my colleague, Professor Kalonji, will go a bit more in the social part. I want to trace out a little bit, where are we in this dialogue? What has research contributed to that pathway from disasters are as, as unnatural, all the way now to the issue of climate race and how they, and, and existential, the existential part that also we are seeing increasingly taking action. So I wanted to just take a little bit on the journey. What have we done over the last years or so? And what's now, what are the needs? And where do we stand with science, research science and advisory? in order to inform action in the policy and practice domains. So that's a little bit what I wanted to do. It's a personal journey. It's a bit, yeah, I hope it's useful for the debate uh, at that conference. Let me go into that. So yeah, so the idea is a little bit to trace where we are in this pathway. Let's call it the pathways from, yeah, a while back, we thought this as our acts of God, but now we talk a lot about risk development, limits opportunity. What are those steps along this pathway and what has research with practice and policy done and what's missing. The yeah, key accords that we're living up to from Yokohama, so all the way to the SDGs that were mentioned also by Dr. Srivastava. Um, it's important, uh, technology um, and social innovation is important, but it's also important to think about the risk governance. So that's key to me, like who owns risk and who should take action and how can we implement the cycle that goes all the way from framing to policy and implementation, of course, which is not the business of research, but we are supporting that. Um, quickly, a bit theoretically, um, as we talk about risk, we talk about probability and consequences. Some things we know, some others we don't know. And we did need different discourses for those, um, for what we know and don't know. If you have risk, if you know probabilities and consequences, yes. we can talk about instrumental discourse using data models to inform action. On the other hand, yeah, yeah. if things are unknown, yes, sir. Oh, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, if many things are unknown, we talk about complexity or ignorance. We need more epistemological, more science-based, uh, deep uncertainty discussion. If 
We have uncertainty. It's a lot about reflective precautionary action. And very important, um, sometimes we know probabilities of risk, but quite often the consequences are contested or ambiguous. So we certainly need participatory discourse. What I wanted to bring out is that over the last few years, I think we are getting those discourses to come together much more. So data science, technology, yes, but also participation, the question about precaution, where is the climate crisis taking us, and then the whole epistemological challenge. What do we know and what do we not know? That's probably the bottom line I wanted to quickly show, go into. Got a few slides, let me just run through those a bit quickly. So it starts all the way early on <clears throat> with the first steps, supporting transitions on unnatural disaster risk. So how, how is disaster risk shaped? So key question is what, yeah, what is it? What's instrumental and epistemological contributions? How do we understand risk? So it has been a lot about the socioeconomic vulnerability that needs to be linked to hazards. So that has been in the early 2000s. And so that's of course well known to you. Um, as a second step, the question has then has been, okay, how do we think about development implications of disaster risk? So how do we combine maybe a now more instrumental, epistemological, but also increasing the participatory element in those discourses. It involves socioeconomic risk modeling, risk financing, tools for stakeholder dialogue. Um, here questions have been, okay, how can we refocus disaster aid? Have, has also given rise to the whole um, country or regional insurance agenda that is taken forward by some international finance institution. Uh, basically, the idea is, of course, to do more preventive risk management instead of only wait and see and paying for the losses and impacts after the fact. So good balance to be struck. So that's a bit old, and but I thought I'd just quickly show that. So that involves our CATSIM model, where, which, where we try to think about risk, assess risk, and think about what risk means in terms of fiscal vulnerability. My key focus on these slides is a bit on the public sector, on the fiscal perspective of things. Question is then, if you understand risk from high frequency, low impact to low frequency, high impact, what are those chunks here? Risk reduction, risk financing, and where is this threshold where uh, countries have a hard time to pay for risk reduction, but also pay for the impacts afterwards? So what's that threshold uh, where countries are facing um, issues that need attention? So that's this notion of risk layering, which I find quite useful because it parcel things out, who should be responsible, who is responsible from national to also international levels, as we increasingly talk about climate change. So that helped us, uh, we have worked like developing risk distributions that tell you for certain return periods of events, like up to 40, 50, 100 year events, what are certain financial sources that are, should, that are available and should be made available domestically and nationally, but also internationally. So that goes already into that question, who's, yeah, who should support morally, but also like explicitly action in places that are vulnerable. I've taken that forward to think about fiscal or financial risk tolerance globally. Um, so this is linking hazards with the socioeconomic or fiscal vulnerability and identifying areas that probably need a more, bit more attention. These are areas in red where further support could or should be granted. Mr. Globus already provides this, he goes into that space of global solidarity for dealing with disasters. So disasters as a global issue. To think about action is quite important to think about model-based dialogue, right? So scientists, um, consultants can crunch numbers, come up with suggestions, the solutions lie with those um, colleagues that are charged with taking action in disaster management authorities, but also in finance ministries and other line ministries and agencies. So it's really important to yeah, sit together literally and around estimates and around models, tools, etc. <clears throat> There's also something that's not really new, but I wanted to bring that out only. Um, so the next step now takes me a bit into the climate space. Um, an important issue in the end of 2010s or so has been yeah, how, we, how do we work with climate variability and change? How are disaster risks amplified by climate change? And what are synergies for tackling climate change and disaster risk? So that goes now into the space of more reflective aspects. So if climate change leads to high level impacts, what are precautionary actions to be taken? 
and um, of course also means like uh, supporting action on greenhouse gas emission reductions because as we are seeing limits adaptation so involves to go into the climate risk space and thinking about thinking about the climate attribution part because so like already a while back the ipcc in its last report and the current report is being uh, put together actually we have a deadline next week for that uh, but 214 ipcc were as well shown that we are seeing impacts including from disasters across all oceans and continents and they're being amplified by climate change so extreme events being amplified by climate change and the other way around so that's bad news and what role can science and consultancy play here um yeah there's a key role to think about what's dangerous um, what's dangerous interference and what are the specific needs and special circumstances of particularly vulnerable countries. And that comes from the climate convention. It's good, but there's many challenges and uncertainties as identified. So what's the human contribution? <laughs> Again, that's the vulnerability component um, to risks and um, yeah, also to hazards. And also what's the attribution part? You know, how is climate change linked to that? And here, important progress has been made over the years, I would say. Quickly, a quick example also, what could that mean and what do we know and not know? Um, so that's a bit also not fully know, but for example, for Bangladesh, we have seen there's quite some variability in terms of the volatility, in terms of recorded losses so from river line flooding and the billions US dollars. Um, what would that mean? Like take the average, decadal average, what would that mean for the future? <clears throat> and here key questions are still, um, uh, to take this forward into a scenario space so what are uh, what could be losses in a, in a changing climate if vulnerability is constant or vulnerability is dynamic so of course if actions are being taken bangladesh is a hotspot in terms of hazards but it's also a hotspot in terms of action um so what's what's the space here where risk could end up um could they would they rise and this is like uh, the kill averages would they rise dramatically or can they be somewhat stabilized and these are key questions that are still a bit open and need attention in science, but also need attention in policy dialogue to think a bit about more clearly what's what what's the what does the future bring, and all these futures here are just projections. So these are scenarios, and so it's just the projecting of the space where action can happen. So that's a bit to set up, set up the space now for this last transition that I wanted to mention. So this climate risk science for the climate crisis, we have the COVID crisis, but we have the latent climate crisis also. So how do we think about the limits to managing or adapting to risk and how to broadly build resilience? Now in comes issues for justice and transformation. So these are also really hot topics for adaptation risk management, as you know. Um, and here it's a lot about learning and climate justice and thinking again about the risk layering part that I wanted to bring in. As these things are also now being negotiated globally. So with disasters that are, have global repercussions, they're also being globally debated in the climate space and that's as part of the loss and damage debate where we have a contested debate um, let's call it like countries vulnerable countries that are heavily affected demand compensation for risks that they and losses that they incur then the northern countries the big polluters are not so willing uh, willing to support insurance and solutions etc but not to think about the big picture i think we need to come together and hear risk science and policy and practice need to play and play an important role. And one of the key colleagues working in that is also Salim Hook that was, I think, in the conference last yesterday. You maybe have mentioned that. So here, the, the, what, what is it? So again, it's a contribution by uh, epistemic contribution. Um, we are seeing now that disaster risk management is facing limits. We are seeing first evidence on limits adaptation and that was projected in the report on 1.5 degrees of warming by the IPCC. We see, for example, coastal livelihoods, um, that sea level rise increased wave up uh, aridity and decreased freshwater availability can lead to, can lead to limits to adaptation um, as incremental risk management, coastal defenses, insurance, reef restoration, but also transformational actions, managed retreat, et cetera, may not be enough and is forcing people out and is really like leading to migration and displacement. So that's, of course, a very unhappy story for now and also for the future. And here's all science and all policy practice are really challenged to take action forward. And we have, again, suggested our risk layering framework where it's a lot about 
contribute roles for the international community to think about what can the loss and damage debate yeah. um, contribute. Yes. In addition to the DRR and climate change adap um, adaptation discourses that focus a lot on risk management and risk finance for loss and damage debate is a lot about this high level red part here. How do we think about forced migration, retreat and livelihood transformation? Who is responsible? Like what, what are their, their support and financial implications? So these are really tough challenge, tough discussions that are ongoing now. They're very important. There's implications here. How can we think about regional and national pooling? Can we consider a global compensation pool? Bangladesh is leading the way. They're setting up a national pool. They're not waiting for the international community to come together. But oh, how can this be funded, of course, is a key question. And now also international institutions are coming in now offering um, debt relief for climate vulnerable countries. So that's also like this has happened in April. And so that's also interesting development. So it's a lot about accountability sure. and justice here that's happening. And this brings yes. me to my summary quickly. Sure. Um, so I think um, we see important evolution. We have great technology, technological development, developments, but we have also important evolution in the discourses so that are where epistemological, instrumental, reflective and participative discourses are coming together to inform these grand challenges that are linked to disaster risk and the changing climate. It's really about, there's great potential for informing action. It's about, yeah, the science society uh, where action needs to be taken. Practice policy and the research playing an important role. Last one here. It's still about the multiple drivers of disasters and climate risks. So it's always like this, hazards, vulnerability, exposure. Increasingly, the role of responsibilities from global to local have come to the fore and need attention. Uh, also, like some actors are taken to the courts, as you know. Um, and so that's, this is really a big debate of, of governance. Justice principles become relevant. We need different methodological approaches to import and support that action. Overall, there's this imperative to really like so society practice and policy to come together and work on the issues. So that was my, my quick and actually a bit longish tour de table. I wanted to show a little bit what's the pathway from disasters as act of God, taking us unfortunately into the climate crisis. But I think there's the glass is not empty, it's half full. So uh, research plays an important role here with um, yeah, the other players to um, yeah, support for the action in that space. That's what I wanted to show and hope um, that you found that useful. Over to you again. Thanks. It was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Sanjay, I'd like to um, share that uh, Q&A session. There are a few questions actually we can see on the chat box. Reynard, also you can see. I mean, there are a few questions directed to you. So you can open the floor for the Q&A. Um, so Q&A will be, uh, can be posted on the chat box and uh, maybe in short, Reynard can respond. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, please, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. And uh, uh, I think there is a question from uh, Professor Islam. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, the question from Professor Islam is, uh, I think, directed to uh, to Renard. Any reflection on how to make model-based dialogue process uh, more uh, uh, more acceptable in policy and accessible to community level. So, mm -hmm. uh, over to you, Ron. Yes. Oh, thanks. Thanks, uh, Ranjay. So, uh, I think it's come from Navarun Varma, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so, we sit here in Vienna, we work quite a bit in the Asian space, etc. But what we have realized, so research touching base, for example, at to community levels is complicated, right? So, increasingly, we work with civil society and NGOs, uh, of course, also local governments. We have this Flood Resilience Alliance set up where we work at community levels across the globe with key NGOs, and they really lead the way. Of course, they are embedded in communities in Nepal and Bangladesh and other places. They got their knowledge workers, they got trust in those communities, and they help us to also enter that space. For us from Vienna, touching base uh, it's useless. We need those intermediaries, this key actors in the boundary space. And there's also been very important, I would say, social innovation um, with those NGOs interacting with communities and taking things forward, including with technology, as Dr. Sivastava identified, how can we use 
uh, big data also to inform action here. So that's that's very exciting and exciting for us to really work towards action. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Nair. Any suggestions, Dr. Nair, to encourage nature-based solutions for DRR and with the community engagement? Oh, it's not my field. Yeah, it's a hot topic. Yeah, this is a big, big topic, hot topic. So it's not really okay. my field, but um, ah. um, I think it's, it's of course, it's very relevant. And so we further need to think about this. There's integration happening. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there is yet another comment on you, uh, Ronald, that uh, to move from uh, symbolic to concrete action, distributive, distributive and compensatory justice principle and action on risk management. Give us good example by action by local governments and communities. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, that's an easy question. Okay. Uh, now wait, let me let me bring back this 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 flood resilience alliance. Maybe that's 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 um maybe that's interesting. Here, for example, we work with uh, partners in Bangladesh, Mercy Corps, Practical Action in Bangladesh and Nepal. It's about understanding resilience in communities, but it's also about acting on it, right? So it's also a local, like said, a supporting early warning in river basins in Nepal that don't have that as much. It's about self-help groups being set up and um, in other means um, that are being supported. So that's really leading to action, resilient, understanding resilience leading to action. At the same time, we are taking that work also forward with national governments that sometimes are willing, sometimes it's a bit more complicated, as we all know, and debate also being fostered here, as well as we take it to the international debate. As you know, what's discussed internationally in policy circles is quite different from community level action. But with this project where we really go all across all scales, I think we can really like instill um, concrete uh, needs for action at community scales into the international debate, but also bounce back discussions that happen globally. So what's the evidence, for example, where, where do we hit the limits of adaptation in certain places, uh, certain vulnerable countries? And can we provide that evidence? And actually, I have a session this afternoon at this Columbia University conference on managed retreat, where the idea is, so do we see that? Do we see a retreat, a forced retreat or managed retreat? And those NGO partners can help us to identify this evidence that we can then propel to international levels. So it's really about these networks um, that work at different scales to inform actions. I'm happy yeah. to provide more uh, stuff. And Loy, of course, Loy, be happy to be in touch on that, yeah. Uh, thank you. I think there is the last one again from Professor Islam. <laughs> that is about yeah. uh, some scenario you showed based on SRES scenario for Bangladesh. Uh, do yeah. you have any study scenario based on RCP? Yeah, caught me. Yeah, so that's the old scenarios. <clears throat> We're working on this. Uh, we have a paper on the way on, on trying to uh, work. Yeah, we, we have actually worked quite a bit with colleagues in Bangladesh on on climate on, on climate related risks. Um, a flood, river and flooding that's driven by climate and that's of course totally going to the rcp and ssp space so expect that to come out later this year so that what i've shown has been a bit old i agree thanks uh, thank you ronald so this is from thanks. the audience side thank you very much uh, thanks a lot uh, yeah uh, over to you professor Park. okay thank you this is excellent you know, there are lots of questions coming uh, and uh, also your all the participants you are free to uh, write the questions in the chat box for both and uh, all three of the speakers and we will also convey that message to the speakers and uh, the response all, also we can get uh, later on as well okay our next speaker is uh, professor gretchen kalonji from sichuan university uh, so right, right now gretchen is uh, dean of the Chun University. She is Dean in uh, Institute for Disaster Management and Reconstruction uh, for a couple of years. She is also Assistant Director of General uh, she, uh, for Natural Sciences at UNESCO. And she had responsibility for several large scale international and intergovernmental science programs uh, with UNESCO. So with IDMR, I, uh, and she is a great supporter of our activities uh, with AIT very closely working with a couple of networks uh, with EC mode as well uh, on the Himalayan University Consortium, uh, partially on the DRR initiative in the region as well. So with this brief background introduction, I'd like to invite Professor Kalonji to take the stage and uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Welcome again. Thank you, Dr. Nair. Uh, 
First of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me and to offer my sincere congratulations to AIT for pulling together this amazing conference. I mean, got so much depth and so many parallel sections, it's so hard to choose between them, but really, really very, very well done. I'd also like to congratulate the two speakers before me on their really excellent presentation. I hope some of my remarks will resonate with, uh, with some of theirs. So I, I'm going to really focus on a topic that uh, uh, Dr. Srivastava mentioned, which is the importance of more effectively linking of the health sciences. He focused on pandemics, but of course, as many other health emergencies. Uh, on the one hand, with the natural sciences, social sciences, and engineering, on the other hand, to uh, more effectively address these complex risks. And uh, you'll see in my talk a lot of focus on the roles of research universities and the necessity for innovation in our research and educational uh, progress. So, you know, the, the concept, I think, of One Health is quite uh, useful in thinking about intersections between a, a broad set of health issues and uh, and natural hazards. I won't, I won't read all of these things here. I'm sure you guys are familiar with these, with these topics, but it provides, I think, a, a powerful framework. And another point I would like to make is that while the Sendai framework really did a good thing for the community, in putting an enhanced uh, focus on risk rather than only on disaster response. That was very good. But at the same time, I think we can all see that, particularly in the context of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, that we also need to uh, be prepared to respond, emergency response, because no matter how good we are on risk reduction, we are going to have mega disasters. We are going to have more uh, epidemics. And so we need to work together. We need to integrate the science with the emergency uh, management capacity. So, you know, uh, some of the responses, I think, uh, movement in our community you know, after the uh, uh, outbreak of, uh, of the COVID-19 has been to more effectively recognize the importance of making these linkages. And so the WHO, you know, has this framework now they call health emergencies and disaster risk management. And if, if some of you have not yet read that document, I, I, I urge you to look at it. And, and they have established a uh, leading research team led by Virginia Murray of Public Health in England and Emily Chan of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, who really has a very exciting joint center with Oxford and others on linking natural disasters and medical humanitarian response. So there's other international partnerships that I can cite. I'm heavily involved with this high level experts and leaders panel on water and disasters. And uh, I just would like to mention that uh, they also, we also, I should say, uh, last year, uh, starting in early spring, I think we began to focus working with other organizations worldwide on national and local level guidelines for how to deal with that, how to pragmatically deal with that challenge of uh, natural disasters in the context of uh, uh, pandemics. So, and then also I would like to mention that the IRDR program, you know, sponsored by UNDRR and the International Science Council has also done a lot of work recently on rethinking the disaster risk agenda for the uh, coming 10 years. And they also link more the natural sciences, the social sciences and health emergencies. And uh, it was only like a couple of weeks ago that they had this mega conference with participants from 81 countries to come to closure on this new uh, agenda. So I, I want to make a couple, bring in a couple of examples of how some of our universities are rising to the occasion of trying to link the health sciences together with you know climate change, weather extremes, policy, et cetera. So this is a new institute at Fudan University, uh, headed by a gentleman called Tang Xu, who recently came back from a distinguished career at the uh, WMO, and uh, they have a very strong focus on bringing together these interdisciplinary teams and particularly looking at uh, public health and including uh, respiratory diseases. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over and talk a little bit about our university. But my firm conviction is all of our disaster research institutes and universities worldwide need to do a better job on making these kind of linkages. And of course, the strategic opportunities will vary greatly from institute to institute. In our case, uh, we have uh, 
it, it's always ranked in among the top two middle schools in China. And in terms of experience with disasters, it's the top because you know we've had such a prevalence of uh, disasters in, in Southwest China, and uh, most notably the, the uh, one to one earthquake in 2008. So our institute is highly interdisciplinary, and we collaborate closely with our our medical school on the on the topics that I can list there. Emergency medicine is is, is a very large focus, and I'll have a couple of slides about that. We've also created, together with Hong Kong Polytechnic University, this disaster nursing master's program, uh, which is a two-year program that uh, uh, really has been uh, very influential within China, in and also useful within China in graduating the kind of cohorts of nurses who are able to uh, immediately uh, deal with crises in the front line. Of course, the public health and disasters is another major focus. We have people working in disaster spatial epidemiology, also the post-disaster environmental management and its health-related implications, including you know, air, water, I forgot soil, also soil quality, and also the often neglected topic of disaster waste management. Uh, on a very practical medical uh, uh, level, there's the rehabilitation sciences for people who are injured, lose limbs, etc in disasters. Uh, the, on a more social uh, uh, science type of a theme, you know, the resilience of, the, of healthcare systems is an important uh, focus of our research. And on a very pragmatic level, we offer short-term courses for medical professionals uh, from, from out China and uh, other regions uh, increasingly. Uh, so I, I just want to talk a little bit about the uh, our work with our medical school and with the WHO on constructing the international emergency uh, management uh, response. So, you know, we've been designated in within China to host of what will eventually be seven national bases, and we cover Southwest China, including Tibet. So, uh, after getting that designation and after a very big, vigorous review process, we've been certified as a type three international emergency medical team by the WHO. Top three is actually the highest. It sounds like it might not be the highest, but it is the highest. And uh, we, we share this uh, level with the Israeli army uh, emergency medical team. Uh, to my knowledge, up until, uh, until at least very recently, we're the only university to have that uh, uh, designation worldwide so basically the way it works is that on the request of member states our team about 300 doctors and nurses has to be deployed within six hours to show up at the site of a mega disaster and as you can imagine there's a huge amount of uh, logistical challenges related to being able to do this so this was uh, the who uh, evaluation process had three uh, visits and this is the last visit we outside of our Institute for Disaster Management and Reconstruction, which set up this 60 uh, tent emergency hospital. So as I said, uh, the, when deployed, uh, people have to show up and be able to set up these facilities and to be independent of local water, power, waste, et cetera, so as not to be a burden on local communities. So we actually have our engineering students and social science students and medical students working together on how to address some of these challenges. So uh, you don't need to see all, all of these slides, but again, we were uh, you know, extremely excited about this. And for me, it was intellect, I'm, you know, by background, a material scientist, but it was very into, intellectually exciting for me to see how all of the pragmatic issues having to do with this kind of emergency medical response uh, need to come together. So just to give you a little glimpse inside, I mean, there's two high level cleanliness operational rooms. There's OBGYN, there's uh, uh, in, uh, isolation spaces for people with infectious diseases. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, challenges that need to be, need to be met. And so, you know, basically this happened, we got this certification before a COVID outbreak. And so this, this is the, our teams on the way to Wuhan. And they spent uh, up to three months in Wuhan, including a lot of our disaster nurses, the medical people, public health people, et cetera. Just an overview of, of the nature of the teams. But I found it, you know, very, sat very satisfying, very touching. Uh, to hear the stories, particularly from the disaster nurses in their WeChat group about their day-to-day -day experience.
all these uh, challenges in uh, Wuhan. So again, talking a little bit uh, more about what our research universities need to do. We, we've talked about this, you know, basically for all of my academic career, we need to be more interdisciplinary, less siloized, et cetera. But we have a very concrete uh, pressing example in terms of the intersection between health emergencies and uh, natural natural hazards. So the approach that we take uh, is a multidisciplinary team-based project approach in which we have teams of students working across disciplinary boundaries and, and starting as early as freshman year, in fact. So it's not only postgraduate students, but we believe the, uh, in the importance of engaging undergraduate students. And so, and we also believe that all of the students in our institute some of the students have more civil engineering background, some more social science, some more, uh, you know, architecture, urban planning. Everyone needs to know, have a basic understanding of the impacts of disaster health sciences on, on our world communities and the understanding of the interconnections between all of these topics. Wow, we just heard a bang in our building. <laughs> okay, so to give you a, a rather <laughs> a cluttered picture of our curriculum, uh, in, in our vision, you can see this, this diagram. So basically, all of our students will have some exposure, some level of exposure to health sciences related to disasters, to natural sciences, uh, to, in, uh, in, to disasters in the built environment, and to social sciences. And they, they then specialize in one of those areas so that they have a combination of the uh, big picture, but the professional depth. So I want to give you an example because we're, we're very excited about this new undergraduate level so-called international innovation class. Students join this class at the beginning of their sophomore years and so they have three years of uh, research experience in interdisciplinary teams. Each team has both Chinese and foreign supervisors and the program is open to students from all majors. In the first round, which, which we admitted last fall, you can see they're all over the place in terms of their majors. So it's an exciting opportunity for the students to also learn about each other's uh, disciplines. Um, it's a challenge, of course, logistically. So to, to give you a, a picture, these are the, in the first year of this innovation class, these are the themes that we're working on. Disaster mental health is a big component of our efforts here at ID, IDMR. And so there's projects underway of mental health of nurses, and also mental health of college students themselves. Uh, we work together with UNESCO and one of its uh, category two centers on how to better map the international collaborations in research and education using some, some knowledge graphing type uh, methodologies. We have a disaster education theme, uh, working with local communities, uh, climate stress and urban resilience, focusing on, on urban flooding, urban heat islands. We have a, a fascinating one called Water Disaster and Culture, which looks at uh, the intersection uh, between uh, th these three topics, uh, using as platform uh, the, the UNESCO and other uh, designated sites in Sichuan and uh, earth sciences focusing mostly on landslides and landslide early warning systems. And again, resilience of healthcare systems. And uh, as I mentioned before, the environmental management. So, you know, we're very excited about this approach and always happy to have interest from other potential collaborators. So again, I just like to focus on the importance of international alliances and, and let you know what, where some of our energy has been going. We, uh, we were successful in getting funding from the Chinese Academy of Sciences uh, for something called ANSO DRR, which focuses on uh, disaster risk reduction in Belt and Road regions. So that's a large scale. It's currently institutions in 17 countries are involved. Uh, I've been involved since my UNESCO days in this high level panel on, on water and disasters. And it has uh, three flagship initiatives. And we, together with uh, my colleague, Professor uh, Toshio Koike in uh, iCharm in Japan, where they're focusing on leading a, an initiative on alliance of alliances in uh, water and disasters. The youth and young professional involvement is really, really important to us. And uh, our main platform for that has been the You Inspire Alliance, uh, which was originally set up uh, by some visionary young scientists in Jakarta, but now has uh, 12 countries involved and more than a thousand scientists. Also, we, we, we've had quite a lot of involvement with Issue Mode and, and the HUC. Um, 
on disaster risk reduction and resilience. So just to, to, to tell you a little bit about this help, every, every two years we organize a special session at the UN General Assembly on water and disasters. And it so happens that uh, the fifth session is this afternoon, <laughs> later this afternoon. And so this was the first session. And as you can see, uh, of course, it's Ban Ki-moon, but that's also the then crown prince, now emperor of Japan, and Dr. Han Sung Tzu, the former prime minister of Korea, who heads our health body. And it was, it was quite amusing in this first session because we had two, two princes who now became king, because there was Prince of Orange, now uh, king of uh, the Netherlands. So that's, that's going on uh, later today, and, and a lot of the information about that will be public. Ten member states have co-sponsored this event this year. So again, I mentioned uh, you inspire. I don't have time to talk about it too much, but again, it's uh, it's quite bottoms up uh, with, uh, in terms of uh, networks of uh, youth and young professionals. So these are people who are actually doing research uh, related to uh, disaster risk reduction. And uh, it was originally started with assistance from the UNESCO office in Jakarta, uh, but there because the student, the young folks are really quite self-engaged. Some of the other UNESCO offices in Asia Pacific also helped uh, create a new, new chapters of the UN Spire. And in terms of the COVID situation, they've undertaken quite a lot of exciting uh, uh, research efforts. So in uh, conclusion, I just wanted to stress again that, you know, our research universities need to uh, be more imaginative in linking the, the various disciplines that are related more broadly to risk and development and uh, building on this WHO's progress in this area, I think is very, very important. Uh, the other community that often gets left out uh, or is not sufficiently engaged, by the way, is the engineering community and particularly the engineering professional societies. So uh, in order to do this, it, we, we can't just continue with business as usual in our educational programs and, and our research programs and expect that we're going to maximize our Im Im impact. So we need to uh, do a better job integrating uh, research into the curricula of our students, which of course is also very good for their intellectual development. So oh, of course, uh, COVID has been a global tragedy. The losses are enormous, but you know, it, I think it also provides us with a little bit of a strategic lever to uh, move in new and creative uh, directions. And so I hope we don't lose uh, that opportunity, that we take full advantage of that opportunity to uh, fundamentally uh, challenge our models of research and education in our research universities worldwide. So again, we're always looking forward to forging further partnerships and feel free to get in trust, touch with me at this uh, address. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Gretchen. I'd like to request Chair and Dr. Sanjay. Please yeah. go ahead with the Q&A session. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. I think Gretchen has covered a wide ranging issues and the question in Q&A from one of uh, uh, Mr. Bhushan uh, Rai Shingi. Uh, multidisciplinary participation, engineering, science, technology, it's a huge task to collaborate and get results with the future opportunities. I think uh, disaster research centers sh shall become a larger place to do this and bring more internship and projects. I think uh, we all agree with this idea. Uh, would you like to say some more light, particularly the your uh, interdisciplinary center is doing and uh, what are your uh, experiences? Uh, what could be some key takeaway message because AIT is also working in the similar direction of interdisciplinary participation with a huge yeah. network of partnership. A uh, few more, uh, I think you can say some more light on this. This is a truly a challenging task, yes. It really is challenging, but yeah. uh, if it were hard to do, others would have already done it. It's challenging, but it's vitally important. And speaking of AIT, I would love to have closer uh, collaborations with time because I think that if, if you know a relatively small cluster of research universities can support each other you know we have we have this profit in her own land syndrome and sometimes the university higher level leadership listens more if yeah. some messages come from uh, other universities but in terms how, how our institute works is the following I mean uh, uh, we we hire 
from a wide spectrum of uh, disaster related disciplines. And so we have approximately one third health, one third natural science and engineering and one third social science. And we pay a lot of attention in choosing our faculty to people who have had international experience and who demonstrate through our very extensive interview process, their desire to do this. Because you know the reward to, to engage in creative interdisciplinary partnerships, because otherwise it's just, it's, it's just impossible. And uh, so we have got a lot of young faculty members at the associate professor level who are increasingly discovering how much fun it is to forge these kind of uh, joint projects. The reward system in most universities worldwide, and perhaps particularly so in China, does not favor this kind of activity. It favors more single author publications in one's own discipline. And so, you know, as, as dean, one of the things that I have to do is I have to try and massage the system and the reward structures of, of the university to give the young, young scientists some space to do this. I think one of the things that we we can do a better job on is our connection with the private sector. Uh, we, we have, um, and particularly when you, you're talking about all of the uh, all of the technologies and the importance of all of the technologies, which I agree, having the private sector partnerships is important. Our governmental partnerships are quite good, quite strong. We, we have a national key lab on uh, youth education and DRR. We have a provincial uh, the key lab, which focuses more on, uh, you know, science and engineering. Uh, we, as I told you about with, with the medical school, we have a lot of partnerships. We have a new partnership with the Red Cross also in more the, uh, emergency response training. So we're, we're, we are quite weak to date in, uh, in the private sector partnership. And I'd like to devote more of my energy and the energy of my colleagues to that in the future. I know EIT does a good job uh, quite a good job in, in that regard. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Just one more point. Right, right, Only please. way we do this is, if, is because we offer our own degrees. Right. right. So we have our own master's, our own PhD, and now the innovation class for the undergraduates. We're striving to get a new undergraduate major. Without that, it would be basically almost impossible uh, to integrate the research into the educational pathways. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is one follow-up question from Dr. Pasant Raj Adhikari. Uh, this is regarding your innovation class. Uh, to what extent it follows this Sendai 4 priority uh, on its uh, innovation strategy for sustainable risk uh, reduction? Your innovation classes vis-a-vis -vis Sendai 4 priority, how you draw uh, some ideas on Sendai priority uh, to develop your innovation classes. Well, I think it's basically in in harmony. Yeah. But we also say that with the uh, with uh, the innovation class, we have a very strong focus on uh, the sustainable development agenda, including the Sendai framework. Mm -hmm. All of these kids, as as uh, sophomores, study a lot about you know the pragmatics of all of the UN processes. So, but in terms of innovation, I mean, innovation is really at the core. And so these have the opportunity, uh, in addition to working on their research projects, to propose their own innovation and entrepreneurship uh, programs. And they get funding from our university. And if they're successful, they get national level funding and recognition to do sort of innovative projects of their own. Thank you. Thank you, Jitchen. So we got a lot of compliments from the participants. Great insight on interdisciplinary research. Thank you, Jitchen. So thank you very much. This is from, from my side, uh, Professor Paul, over to you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Dr. Sanjay. And uh, great thanks to all three of you for, for uh, really a uh, variety of perspective. Actually, we also discussed uh, last week, we, I had a quick chat I mean, uh, with Gretchen not to overlap. I mean, she was very much uh, sort of, uh, I mean, I should not say scared, but like uh, like uh, so, some problem, like maybe there are some overlap with the uh, topic or some subjects, but I see it's completely exclusive presentation from each of you and really covered a lot of things, uh, starting from the interdisciplinary activities to the education part, as well as 
the numerical modeling component and the recent development in the technologies so i think we covered a lot exactly the keynote sessions uh, area we tried to in one and one hour 15 minutes and the time is also quite well managed thanks to all three of you uh, with that we'd like to conclude this session thanks again to all three of you thank you thank you so much